Thanks or one? Just one. Interviews, much music, take one. Let's hope there's only one take. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one take matters here. <laughs> Firstly, thank you very much for sitting down with us. It's a big deal for us. No problem. Um, usually when an artist... I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm kind of a big deal. I've heard that. No, kind I'm of kidding. A big deal. No, Have you anyways. been doing clip strap with Kanye, actually? I'm kind of a big deal? No, not yet. Oh, very good. I'll make sure I check it out, though. Check it out. Because it must be about me. It must be about you. No, I'm kidding. Anyways. Um, usually when an artist of your level releases their seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth record, for that matter, it's almost like, you know, it, it's an afterthought, you know, because to their fan base, it's not necessarily a big surprise. Artists and bands, after their, you know, X amounts of records, are usually on autopilot. Because you've been gone for so long and because you've gone through the kind of stuff you have since the last record, does it kind of feel like a reintroduction? Um, yeah, it kind of does, honestly. Um, I guess it was, you know, with, with this record, it's kind of a way for me to, um, I don't know if it's necessarily reinventing myself, but it, but it, it's, it's kind of in a sense, um, I kind of wanted to go back to, it's kind of like reintroducing myself, like I, I just wanted to go back to, you know, kind of the Marshall Mathers LP days or the Slim Shady LP, you know, the, like the first two records, that's, that's kind of like the, I mean, I guess the feel that, that this record, I, I guess I wanted to capture, you know, mm -hmm. and make it kind of feel like that and just, you know, a, a, a reintroduction, you know. There was, I mean, there was a time when you didn't know whether you were going to put out a record at all. I mean, I w heard a Hot 97 interview when 50 was on, and you called in and you were saying essentially that, you know, things were really great for you right now, and, you know, you felt like you were ready to make music again, but you kind of alluded to a time in your life where things seemed to be kind of be falling apart and you weren't sure, uh, you know, whether or not you actually wanted to make records again. How bad did things get during those times? Well, things got pretty bad. I mean on a personal level and I mean career wise I knew that I needed to take a break mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to take a break and I knew I needed to take a break from basically from the spotlight and I guess I kind of found you know something that I like doing as far as like producing records I kind of you know I guess I, I I started like you know playing around with producing records a lot more and started getting into that and almost S it kind of s not sidetracked but just like all right this is what i'm into now like i want to help produce artists on my label and you know kind of work on that for a little bit take a break from the spotlight put some put some new artists out and stuff like that and and basically at that point in time i don't think i knew exactly what i wanted to do i mean i was going through a pretty serious drug addiction at the time I, you know my best friend passed away like there was a lot of things that were going on and I think at that time my world was kind of just like spiraling you know mm -hmm. I wasn't sure exactly where I was going with my career but basically that's why I needed to just take a a break mm -hmm. you know what I mean I, I had to I think I went I think I went eight seven or eight years straight without taking a break at all you know mm -hmm. and I was missing a lot of my kids growing up and you know a lot of things like that so I just wanted to chill out for a minute it was sleeping pills, right? Yeah. Um, well, sleeping pills, um, sleeping pills, like Valium, Ambien, okay. uh, stuff like that, but also, I mean, Vicodin, you know, basically whatever I could get my hands on and anything that I felt like could make me fall asleep, mm -hmm. you know, from NyQuil. Even. Why did you have so much trouble sleeping? I think, I think most of it was probably in my head. Right. You know, I think that I sort of got on the track where it was like, okay, my career is moving really fast. Mm -hmm. Things around me are moving really fast. So let me go for the quick fix. Right. I can't sleep tonight and I got a hectic schedule tomorrow. So let me go for the quick fix. And at first it started out kind of reaching for the NyQuil mm -hmm. and then the NyQuil didn't work. And now I need something stronger. It's funny because I was, when I was preparing for this, I was reading a lot about um, addiction to sleeping pills and the story you're telling me about, you know, things started getting crazy and then you start with NyQuil. That's kind of mirrors every single story I've heard or read about online about, you know, people who are addicted to sleeping pills. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, I mean, for me, I don't know how, how it starts for everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that that, I, I mean, that's how it started for me, so I could see, I could see it starting that way for, right. you know, other people or whatever, but it's kind of how it started with me, and it was like, when I stumbled on the Valium, it was like, okay, this is, I think this is my drug of choice. Right. You know, it was kind of like, I never really... I never really had a uh, a problem with alcohol. 
I never really had a problem with, you know, any other substance, you know, until, like, in other words, not saying I didn't have my moments right. when I was drinking and, 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 and shit like that, but, but I also, you know, just like, I, for some reason I was able to kind of shut those things off. And Valium, I started building up a tolerance to it, you know, uh, Ambien, you know, you, you start taking those things and, and it gets in your system and you build up a tolerance you need more and more and more you know and it's I mean and I never once like really stopped to think like you know addiction kind of runs in my family a little bit too so maybe you know and addiction from what I understand it's it's you know got a lot to do with genetics mm -hmm. you know what I mean and, and I never like really stopped to think about that that there's other members of my family that are that are addicts themselves you when know? you talk to people who are addicts or who have addicts in the family you hear a lot um, words thrown around like rock bottom like every addict kind of hits the rock bottom what was yours, or did you have one? Well, I don't know if I necessarily had a rock bottom. I, I mean, there, I actually probably had a few rock bottoms, but you know, basically, when when I went to rehab, you know, I wasn't I wasn't really ready right. to get clean. I know the other people around me were ready for me to get clean, mm -hmm. but I wasn't ready for you know I wasn't ready myself. So <clears throat> I think I stayed in rehab for maybe a total of two weeks you know, and check myself out. And I think I was convinced at that time, like, I'm not an addict, you know. I even had trouble, like, saying it in group meetings and right. shit like that. Like, I'm not an addict. This is, you know, something I can fix. This is a sleep problem. I'm going to go to a sleep clinic. I'm going right. to see, you know, if I can fix this problem. And, you know, basically when I got, pretty much when I got home from rehab, mm -hmm. I started taking Vicodin, you know, right. maybe like a week later, if, if even that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one one drug leads to another, you know, and in addiction, like, if you really want to get sober, you can't do anything, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, if you really want to put your disease in remission, so to speak, like, you really, you can't touch anything, mm -hmm. you know, no liquor, no nothing. What were you like to be around when all this was happening? I wasn't fun. <laughs> I mean, maybe to some people I was fun, right. you know? I, I'm sure maybe I was a life at a party to some people. Right. Um, but, no, nah, I just, I, I was real moody, real um, kind of self-loathing, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, uh, you know, everything, woe was me. And I think I just, like, I just went into this, like, really dark place, you know? And I just couldn't, it was hard for me to, to pull myself out of, mm -hmm. you know? Well, it certainly, you can definitely, we, we heard some of the record, and you can definitely kind of hear some of that on the record, and we talk about that dark time. Um, I just read your book, and you talk a lot about um, when you were young and, and your Uncle Ronnie died, um, how you couldn't go to his funeral because you want to remember the man as the man and not a guy laying in a coffin. Um, was that kind of going through your head when you went to Proust's funeral? Um, well... I don't know if it was. I, I think that at that at that point in time, all I could think about was, you know, what what happened to Proof at that moment. I didn't really think like it didn't really bring me back to to that time period. It was kind of like I was, you know, stuck in that moment. And, it, and at that moment, it just seemed like my world was ending. Right. You know, that whole time period was the darkest place that I ever went into in my life. Mm -hmm. You know. And. You know, I, I I took it hard. You know, I took it. I took it pretty hard. Mm -hmm. I think when you hear a lot about you know tragic events and when terrible things happen to the friends of of somebody or you you know your best friend uh, dies, um, you hear a lot of people talking about the first step kind of moving past it is kind of forgiveness. I mean, have you been able to forgive the person who killed Proof? I mean, are you there yet? Um. I don't know if I've actually really thought about that. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of th like like the way that that I, that I that I've been able to kind of deal with it, and like I guess the healing process for me is that I guess to kind of stop beating myself up over the fact of you know thinking like if I would have talked to him maybe that right. day he wouldn't have went to that club. Mm -hmm. If I would have you know uh, if I just would have maybe if I would have been with him. You know what I mean? Those were kind of the right. thoughts that were going through my head and and. Uh, you know, I had to just learn to, to let that go. Like, nothing, no matter what, nothing I say is going to bring him back. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I had to, like, really learn to accept it and, and deal with it and, and learn how to 
I don't know if I've accepted it fully, but I've but I'm able to deal with it mm -hmm. a little better. You know what I mean? How much of that contributed to the fact that we haven't heard from you in, in a long time? Um, a lot, you know. I mean, like I said, when when that happened between the you know, the pills I was taking, right. you know, which are pretty much all mood suppressants, you know what I mean? And that happening, that that's kind of like when I started like really spiraling, you mm -hmm. know, and just I mean, I had a I had a, a drug problem already. Right. I had an addiction I was dealing with already. When that happened, it, I think it was kind of a, a thing went off in my head, just like fuck it. Right. You know, I might as well just might as well take more. You know what I mean? Like maybe this will help me get through. Mm -hmm. You know. And the truth is, you know, it it, it didn't help. Mm -hmm. You know. When you look back on your career now, I mean, it's it's been, I guess, the better part of 10 years now. You, you're you kind of allowed the idea of retrospect now that you're able to look back. Um, I interviewed Marilyn Manson about a year and a half or two years ago, and when you guys were starting to really blow up, you didn't have, you know, necessarily parallel careers, but you were both, you know, on the same track of, you know, being vilified by the U.S. government, being, you know, vilified by the media. You had parents' groups, you know, against you that guys. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> well, I wonder about that. I mean, we talked about the idea of him maybe waking up one morning and saying, you know what, I don't want to be this guy anymore. Because it's a pretty self-destructive way to live. Um, and I kind of wonder, as somebody who's made a career on being controversial, sometimes on purpose, do you ever have those days where you just think, I don't want to be that guy anymore. I don't want to be this guy anymore. Never. 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 Where does that come from? Um, I don't know. I guess I'm just a fucking jerk. <laughs> nah, I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, th there were times where I kind of, I, I think like during the, the second album, like during the Marshall Mathers LP, I think there were times that I felt like, like I don't want to, like, I don't know, almost fed up with everything. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I, like I don't want to be that guy anymore. Like, it, it, is it worth it? Right. You know, it, is it worth all the, the, you know, the harassment or whatever, like the, word I'm looking for is it worth all the bullshit you know right. what I mean like to to go through this and you know I, I think with with the Eminem show I think like in hindsight looking back I think I might have maybe consciously or subconsciously started toning it down just a little bit right. you know from the Marshall Mathers LP and like as it got into encore I kind of toned it down a little more and then uh you know with curtain call the last you know the last album, technically, I guess, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I kind of really toned it down. And maybe when I'm gone, like, you can really hear, if you listen to that record, you can yeah. hear, like, a lot of the stuff that I was going through at that particular time. It was just like, you know, it, it, I mean, I, I still, when I listen to the record, I like it. You know right, what I mean? Because yeah. it captured a feel for me. But it, but it also was like, when I look back at it now, I'm like, that was a little self-loathing on my part you know what I mean that's, but that's I guess that was what I was going through at the time and as an artist that's what you do is what you you know you write about that but now I think that you know I, I kind of like I said I, I kind of went back to the concept that the original D12 concept you know proof uh, his idea of just like we need to just talk about the most bizarre off the wall ridiculous shit that we can think of and say it things that people would never say you know what I mean so I'm kind of like back on that now so I might be that guy again I don't know right we gotta it's wait and see we talked about kind of the legacy aspect and you know maybe looking back in retrospect in, in your career when you listen to the Marshall Mathers LP or when you listen to stuff from 10 years ago do you still relate to that person oh yeah I definitely relate to that person I mean there's a there's a certain tonality of that record like an overall tone in my voice and an overall right. tone of the, the you know those records that that is like um i think back like kind of it seemed like the more vilified i i, I felt like i was becoming or that i got the more uh, i guess the more of a villain i wanted to to become and i, I right. listened to those records and i listened to how angry i was and it kind of you know it puts me back in a place where it was like i guess i was at that particular time i was kind of the underdog you know coming up in the rap game that you know, was just, I mean, I was the underdog, mm -hmm. you know, there's not really a better way to say it, and, um, I don't know, it's just when I listen to those records, I'm like, wow, I was pretty, I was pretty pissed, Right. you know, but. Can, can there be an Eminem record when things are going good? Because it seems like things are, are going really well now, you seem to be in a really great place, you, you know, you were talking about being sober, 
can can there be an Eminem record with you being happy and and, and if there can like be an Eminem record with me being happy, you know there can't really be a happy Eminem record. Right. You know what I mean? Because that wouldn't really make sense now, would it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like I as far as things going uh, okay in my life and 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 good in my life, like yeah, that's you know that's that's true. But like when I make music, you know, I mean. My music is my music, you know, it's my art, and it's kind of like, you know, just, mm -hmm. I don't know, it is what it is. It's, it's interesting to me to kind of watch your videos, and, you know, e even in, in the latest video, you're hitting on, like, Kim Kardashian and Jessica Simpson. When you see these people, I mean, what, are, are they excited about the fact that you're kind of talking about them in their records? I mean... I haven't seen them yet, but I'm sure that uh, they're flabbergasted. Right. No, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't seen them, but, you know, it is what it is. I think that you'd probably think that people would just be used to me by now. Probably. You know what I mean? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. If not, fuck them. <laughs> I want to talk about um, the city of Detroit because it kind of puts uh, things into context for the record and then obviously for you because you're from the city. Um, obviously, Detroit is kind of bore the brunt of everything that's kind of going on in, in the world and, and in the States right yeah. now. You had that kind of open letter to Detroit. Um, what's the mood like in the city? I mean, for somebody who's grown up here and you know, even 10 years ago when things were going well around the world economically, it was still kind of a gritty city to live in. It seemed like there was a recession in Detroit anyway. So, can, you know, what's it like yeah. living here? I mean, well, I, people are pissed. You know, and I can't say I blame them. People are pissed. People are losing jobs. It's 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 messed up right now. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, it's certainly. It, it's I guess it's exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like, it's you know it it, it does kind of feel like I think Detroit is taking a brunt of like a lot of you know what's going on the recession and everything. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, all I know to say is that you know Obama's giving us hope. You know what I mean? And, I mean, that's really all we got right now. Right. You know what I mean? There's hope to be able to, to, to get out of this, you know? Mm -hmm. But the mood in the city, I mean, we were driving in from, from Windsor, and, I mean, it's when you look at the downtown core of Detroit, it's, I mean, there are skyscrapers that are abandoned. It almost feels like, you know, post-apocalyptic. I mean, living here must be different. I mean, living here, you must feel differently than, you know, just looking from the outside in. Well, my personal opinion, I mean, I, I love living here. Mm -hmm. I've lived here all my life, and I'm just comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm comfortable with just, I mean, some people may think that it's, you know, it's fucked up when you come here. You know what I mean? Like, oh, look at this city. It's it's so run down. I mean, but I love my city. This is where I come from. This is what, you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm used to it, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I guess I don't really see when other people look at the city and they talk about it, maybe I'm just kind of tunnel vision, you know, mm -hmm. like I just, I love the city, and of course, yes, I want things to get better, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, but. Um, I want to talk about the friendship with T.I. at this point, um, he, I, I saw an interview online where he was talking about how you guys call each other and, and, and give each other advice, how did that friendship begin? Well, that friendship actually started, like, the first, I think the first studio session we had together, we just, you know kind of clicked mm -hmm. and the way the way the way he works and the way I work are kind of similar and you know also he's just a a, a cool dude mm -hmm. you know what I mean like it's just that there's no bullshit there's no you know he doesn't like he's 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 very much like me in the sense of just our personalities are real real similar you know mm -hmm. just regular people mm -hmm. you know and that's kind of what I seen him as and we just you know started shooting the shit and just developed a relationship through that and just exchanged numbers and you know been calling each other ever since to like you know just talk or what whatever you know mm -hmm. and I know he's went through a lot you know in the past couple of years too so yeah well when his friend uh, was killed he he's talked a lot about um, the idea that he went through he, he became paranoid all the time and that's kind of why he ended up getting picked up and is subsequently uh, gonna be in, in jail for a year did you go through that as well did you go through a, a similar kind of feeling paranoid or you know feeling like that no I didn't really go through through that same uh, that same feeling I just I went through um, you know just experiencing the, the the loss was big enough for me you know you know me and T.I. like especially at that time period we're living two totally different right, worlds mm -hmm. you know what I mean when it comes to that in that sense but 
you know, I just felt like sad. You know, I wasn't really paranoid. I was, I mean, I was angry too, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. I was angry, but you know, I didn't really go through a period where I felt like anybody was out to get me or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. We're going to have, <coughs> we got about two minutes left. Sure. <coughs> Fantastic. Okay. Uh, just one last question. Um, obviously, 8 Mile was a huge success. Uh, a lot of people have been kind of anticipating maybe more movies from you. Is that something that's going to happen? Um, maybe. Okay. I certainly still uh, have my hat in the ring, you know, when it comes to movies. I just, you know, I've been doing the, the, the thing with the, with the record, uh, with these two records, like the past, you know, like the past almost year, pretty much. So, but yeah, I definitely would, uh, would do something, you know, if, if we found the right script and everything was, everything seemed right, I'd mm -hmm. definitely do it. But at this point, music is the priority. Well, music is the priority right now. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, with these two albums and you know Dre's album, like I'm just like really focused on like trying to work on these things and get these out the way. But like I said, my hat's still in the ring. So catch. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All Appreciate right, it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's do one more question to talk a little bit yeah. about the album. To talk about. Sure. Dates, I just want to that kind of stuff. Sure. Just one question. I want to know uh, Spark. What was the spark that got you and Dre back in the studio, and uh, how the production was a little, a little different? Because what I understand is he took hold a little more of the production on yeah. this one, right? Okay. So we'll talk about that. Cool. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. I mean, obviously you talked about the idea that you know you might not ever make a record again. What got you back in the studio? Well, um, me and Dre actually, we had a trip planned uh, to Florida mm -hmm. like last year, I think, like last June or something like that, June, July. And we had planned a trip to, to, to get in the studio. Now, I had a pretty bad case of the writer's block, like the past, you know, three years mm -hmm. before that. And it was, you know, I mean, not writer's block in the sense that I couldn't write anything, but writer's block in the sense of everything that I was writing was, right. you know, I, it, for me, I felt like it was just not up to par. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was kind of nervous about it because the last, like, three, four trips that me and Dre got together, he come to Detroit, I went to LA, mm -hmm. and nothing, literally nothing came out of any of the sessions. Like, I was pretty stopped up, mm -hmm. and I'm sure the pills had a lot to do with it, you know right. what I mean? So, but we went to, we went to Orlando and worked in the studio. It was one of the studios we had went to when uh, recording Encore, mm -hmm. when, when we recorded that record, and um, just clicked again. Like, every beat that he's... You know, I actually made a call to Dre like two weeks before the trip, and I told him I was like, "Yo, homie, I think I might be coming out this writer's block because I started writing songs in my head and I had no beats to them." Right. And he was like, "All right, that's what I want to hear." So we went there and just clicked, and then ever since then, like that's how the relapse concept came about. The relapse record, like, or all all the records started being recorded was that particular trip. I think we did between eight, ten songs, something like that. Okay. And once that happened, it was, you know, the ball was rolling, and then two albums came out of it. Was it Relapse 1 and 2 because it was just too much material to put on one record? Yeah, well, there was a lot of a lot of material. To, to, well, yeah, yeah, there was too much material to put on one record. Right. But there was also a lot of material that kind of started sculpting itself into, this is what I want people to hear first, and then when they get part two, right. I want them to hear this. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it kind of just morphed into, it wasn't really planned. It just, you know... Just, just happened. What is it about Dr. Dre's production that just you know that you click with? Because I imagine, obviously, at your level, everybody wants to work with you. You know, what is it about your, I guess, your synergy or the chemistry between the two of you that just works? Well, I mean, first of all, like sonically, nobody makes tracks like Dre does. Mm -hmm. Like, n nobody makes beats like Dre. Period. So I, I you know, I kind of get. I mean, for me, it was great to be able to put the beats aside, stop doing them, and just focus on the rhyme. You know what I mean? And just, and every track that he was making just was like, caught my ear in a different way. And I just, I mean, I think he was making like 12, 15 beats a day, and at least four, at least four or five of them off each CD, I was writing songs to and coming back like the next day, next two days, and like, I got something to this, I got something to this. But, you know, it's you kind of like a kid in a candy store. I mean, me, I am, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of spoiled by Dre Beats right now, <laughs> you know? It's like Christmas every day. Yeah, it's Christmas every day. Cool, man. Thank you very much for your time. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, man. Cool. Keep this on. Okay.
Oh, I get my sip of Diet Coke now. I've been a good boy. <laughs>